Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel, I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. So a little over a week ago, I received an email from a woman named Mel Jetterberg. She is a lead investigative advocate for an unsolved Jane Doe case. And she so kindly asked me if I could cover this Jane Doe's case on my channel. I started looking into the case, one already on my list of cases to cover, and I realized that this week is the 45th anniversary of the case. So I kind of took that as my sign to finally cover it for a video. I was sent over the police records that Mel has, and that is where most of my information for this video comes from. This is the unsolved case of Finley Creek Jane Doe. We're taking this one back to 1978. On August 27th of 1978, two men, Ron Swiger and Lee Parr, decided to start their hunting trip for the day a bit early. They were originally from Milton Freewater, Oregon, but were about 18 miles north of La Grande, Oregon for the trip in a campground called Finley Creek Cow Camp. They were walking through the woods on a deer trail at around seven in the morning, when one of them, Ron, saw something that caught his attention. It was something protruding out of the ground. Upon further inspection, they both realized it was a skull. It was lying face down in a shallow grave with other skeletal remains nearby. The men were struck by the horror of their discovery, but immediately made their way back to civilization to notify the local authorities. The state police investigators, Doc Baker of Legrand and John Spilker of Pendleton, that were the first at the scene the next day to start investigating. According to the observer, they found a skull atop a grave mound with bones scattered all around. It looked as if animals had dug up the grave. Baker and Spilker were the ones put on the job to examine the entire scene before anyone actually started removing the remains from the grave. The Oregon State Police took it from there, with of course the two hunters being questioned first, but it didn't seem like they had any involvement in the case other than being the individuals to stumble across the remains. And not one set of remains, but it turns out it would be two. After her skeletal remains were discovered, they were respectfully transported to Coffey's funeral home in La Grande. At the funeral home, Dr. Judy Buschek, an experienced pathologist from the esteemed Grand Ronde Hospital Pathology Department, diligently undertook the examination of these remains. She determined that the skeletal remains had belonged to a woman. This woman's bones were not the only ones at the scene. There were also a set of smaller bones, much smaller, that were believed to be her babies. It was actually John Spilker that pointed out the smaller bones that were buried with the woman's and thought she may have been buried with her newborn baby or she possibly was pregnant when she died. The next pathologist who was set to examine her remains would verify these claims. Doc Baker at the beginning did think that possibly the bones belonged to a local woman named May Ferens who vanished while picking mushrooms about eight miles north of the site. But May had been 76 at the time of her disappearance and once they discovered that the Jane Doe may have been pregnant and seemed a lot younger, May was ruled out. After the examination by the original pathologist, the remains were then transported to Portland, Oregon by Detective Doc Baker. They were sent to be examined further by Oregon State Medical Examiner, Dr. William Brady a very well-respected forensic pathologist. Dr. Brady would state that she was a pregnant Caucasian woman between the ages of 18 to 25, and that she had been there in the shallow grave approximately two to four years, possibly longer. He put the woman's height between five feet, two inches tall and five feet, four inches tall, and claimed that she had a slight build. He put her weight between 115 to 140 pounds. He also stated that she had sandy blonde or light brown hair. She was also close to delivery. She was guessed to be between six to eight months pregnant. It is believed that she was a homicide victim. They were unable to determine a cause of death, but approximately two feet of radio antenna wire tied in a knot was found in the grave. So it is believed she may have died as a result of strangulation. Like I stated before, they weren't entirely sure what year she died in, but Lieutenant Keith Lewis of the Oregon State Police was quoted saying, by the manner of the dress, it does appear it was a summertime situation. There is of course the chance that she was wearing a jacket, maybe it was fall, maybe it was the early spring months, and that it simply wasn't at the crime scene. 
but the chances of her death being in winter though seem very slim, unless possibly she had come from an area in the southern states of the country and her body was dumped more north. When it comes to her dental chart, hers was quite unique due to the fact that she had an extensive amount of dental work done during her life. Her teeth were examined by Dr. Brady as well, and he stated that she had amalgam fillings present on all of the first two molars, on multiple premolars, and third molars. The right maxillary molar was absent and the other third molars had erupted. As we know, dental charts can help identify an unidentified individual. So this was very important for them to pay close attention to every detail regarding her teeth. When it came to her skull, which was the first thing that was found, it was basically devoid of skin and tissue. It was in a natural state with no injuries present. The brain was absent, but the bones well-preserved. After information regarding this Jane Doe had been covered in newspapers in the area, calls were starting to come into the department. The first main call came into the Legrand Patrol Office on September 7th. The caller, an anonymous woman, claimed that the remains found in Finley Creek may belong to a 17-year-old girl who went missing from the area in 1977. She stated that the girl's name was Tina Bradford and that she was originally from McMinnville, Oregon and had been in the company of a Paul Warmack at the time. She also stated that Tina had been about seven and a half months pregnant at the time of her disappearance. An extensive search was done in the attempt to locate either Tina or Paul, but even after all of these years, they have never been able to verify if either of these two individuals existed at all. Could this have been a fake call? We don't know. During this time, two different girls were eliminated as possibly being this Jane Doe. The first was Linda Muirhead, whose father verified that she was alive and well and had left a week prior for Europe. The second was Teresa Lim, who had been located in Newport, Oregon, also alive and well, and she had no information to give about the Jane Doe. In late September of 1978, roughly a month after the Jane Doe's remains were found, a press conference was held for the case. This was where the Oregon State Police and then District Attorney Dale Mammon would release to the public all of the information that I just went over and a little bit more. Other than what I just went over, they would also state that the grave she and her unborn baby had been placed in had been about 29 inches deep, 20 inches wide, and four feet long. Her skeletal remains were also incomplete due to the fact animals had disturbed the body, eating away at some of it and most likely carrying some of the bones off. Due to the fact that the grave was only four feet long, she was definitely folded up into the grave. When it comes to the clothing that she had been wearing when she was found, that included red Catalina brand pants that were a size 15 to 16 in juniors. And there were signs that there had been an altercation to the length. She was only between five feet two to five feet four inches in height. So this is of course believable. She was also wearing a white halter top with a flower design on it. And as for what was on her feet, she had on ankle high lace up shoes that the investigative team working on the case now has guessed to be possibly from the brand Red Wing or a generic brand similar to Red Wing. There were also smaller bits of cloth nearby. This included red and white pieces of fabric, white fabric with red hearts on it, cord from a nylon material and loose zippers. Authorities were hopeful that this press conference would result in someone from the public coming forward with any information that may identify this unknown woman who was said to deliver a baby and only about a month or two before she had been senselessly murdered, or at least it was believed that she was senselessly murdered. For now, this woman would be known as Finley Creek Jane Doe and her baby, baby Jane Doe. They would later verify that this woman would have had a baby girl. The next incident that they thought possibly had some connection to their case occurred during the next year. During the next year of 1979, the Oregon State Police and the Thurston County Sheriff's Office received a call regarding an abandoned camp discovered on Forest Road 241. This location was approximately 25 minutes away from the site where the remains of Finley Creek Jane Doe and her baby were found the year prior. 
fire. As the officers arrived at the camp, they observed a makeshift shelter constructed from small wooden poles, which appeared to have been sourced from the surrounding area. Intriguingly, the ends of these poles had been meticulously cut, either by the hand of an individual or through the use of a saw, resulting in a uniform shape. Within close proximity, a sizable hole measuring six feet by six feet by six feet was uncovered. This hole contained an assortment of items ranging from cooking utensils to toiletries to clothing. Of particular interest, around 30 to 40 blue plastic bags produced by Stay Free Mini Pads, a feminine hygiene brand, were discovered. Additionally, a dark blue nylon windbreaker displaying the words Nisqually Eagles, a canteen bottle bearing the marker inscription Tees, and a pair of boots engraved with the names Fox, Holman and Stepatin were also found with the camp. This felt like a huge step in the right direction when it came to this case. Could this be where the woman was camping at? Had she been there with whoever ended up taking her life? They had items with actual names on them, so they felt like tracking down the owners of these items may be a bit easier than if they had no markings on them at all. Well, the following day, after checking out the abandoned campsite, the Oregon State Police received what they thought to be crucial information from Thurston County regarding the Stepaton family. It was revealed that the name Stepaton actually held significance as a relative of the Stepatons had reported his wife missing several years earlier. Could this missing woman be their Jane Doe? This husband, James Jamie Sanchez, had filed a report in 1976 expressing his concerns about the disappearance of his wife, Dana Lou Sanchez. There were indications that she may have relocated to her hometown of Toledo, Ohio, but Jamie had not received any communication from his wife since. Despite the significance of this lead, the case file indicates that no further action was taken to pursue it. But we do know that Finley Creek Jane Doe is not Dana because documentation was uncovered that proved that Dana had been alive beyond 1976, which is around the time that they believe that this Jane Doe died. There is also a record of divorce between Dana and Jamie in 1978. These records were uncovered by researchers on the case and an official rule out of Dana being Finley Creek Jane Doe was made in May of 2020 by Dr. Nikki Vance of the Oregon State Medical Examiner's Office and the Finley Creek Jane Doe Task Force. Through the years, there had been many tips gone through. Some followed through completely and some they weren't able to follow based on limited information but nothing seemed to get them closer to identifying this Jane Doe. Her and her baby's remains had sat at Coffee's funeral home for 12 years before her case was officially closed. And Union County District Attorney Russ West ordered for the remains of the two to be cremated. Not only were they cremated, but he ordered for all of the evidence having to do with the case to be destroyed. Yes, that includes the clothing, the cord, everything. Things that held DNA and could have been used in years to come to hopefully identify the victim. The reason behind this was simply because of how old the case was and that it had been sitting there stagnant for so long. Do I believe that that is a legitimate reason to destroy all evidence in a cold case? No. The skeletal remains of the woman and her unborn baby were sent to a crematorium in Walla Walla, Washington to ultimately, of course, be turned to ash. And since then, both cremated remains are considered lost. The Oregon State Police never got them back. They were never buried and no one knows exactly what happened to them. I can't even begin to convey how frustrated I was when I came across that information. This cold case definitely had its ups and downs through the years. People coming along who cared deeply for it and people coming along who completely mishandled it. In the summer of 2019 though, the Finley Creek Jane Doe Task Force was formed by two individuals who wanted nothing more than to help solve a long running mystery. Those two individuals are Jason Futch and the woman who reached out to me to cover this case, Mel Jetterberg. Jason began researching into the case in January of 2018. And when it comes to Mel, I asked her how she got involved and she said, I became involved when I looked up Union County, Oregon, where I live on the Doe Network and saw that there was a single solitary Doe listed there, a young woman who they suspected was pregnant. I had just finished All Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNamara and thought, I can investigate what happened to the Stowe, so I jumped in and ran with it. She went on to say, I've studied true crime, criminal justice, and criminology for a very long time. So once it all came together with this mystery in my own backyard, 
I couldn't help myself. The task force first got in contact with the medical examiner's office in Clackamas to help in their investigation. And then during the next year, they got in contact with Anthony Redgrave of Redgrave Research to work on a facial reconstruction of the Jane Doe based on photos of her skull. He worked alongside Dr. Amy Michael of the University of New Hampshire Forensic Science Department. On May 5th of 2020, members of the task force and Dr. Nikki Vance released the artist's sketch of the victim to the public for the first time in the hopes that someone may recognize her. This was a ginormous moment for the team and honestly, the case in general. This was the first time anyone had a visual of what she may have looked like in life. After this photo was spread around online, a woman came across it and she saw similarities between her and the unknown woman. She thought that this unknown woman looked like her and because she had a mother who was missing, she thought this could possibly be my mother. In 2021, a woman named Suzanne Timms reached out to Redgrave and also the Oregon State Police and informed them that she thinks the Jane Doe could be her missing mother, Patricia Otto. Patty Otto disappeared on August 31st of 1976 from Lewiston, Idaho, an area roughly 130 miles northeast of where the Jane Doe was found. She vanished after a fight with her husband, Ralph Otto, who was also the father of her two children, Suzanne and Natalie. Suzanne would tell News Nation, I was scared because I could hear upstairs there was crashing and sounds and yelling and my sister's five and I was three and I'm curious so I crept up the stairs. My mom and dad were having a physical and verbal fight and my mom hit him in the face and my dad hit her back and he put his hands around her neck, pushed her up against the wall and drug her out of my sight. Then later on, Ralph would tell Suzanne that their mother was not coming back. Ralph would change up his story a few times, and in the days following his wife's disappearance, he would be found passed out on the couch with a gun and also heavily drinking. Things that were not making him look too innocent. Her wedding rings were also found in his pocket after she went missing. Ralph would ultimately land himself behind bars for trying to hire a contract killer to kill the lead investigator in his wife's case. The verdict was overturned in 1981 on a technicality, but he would die a few years later from a heart attack while behind bars again, but this time for a completely unrelated charge. Most investigators and family members of Patty believe that Ralph murdered her and disposed of her remains somewhere. Suzanne believes he had disposed of them in Finley Creek Cow Camp. She believes her mother to be Finley Creek Jane Doe. Her mother and this Jane Doe had similar hair color. They were roughly around the same height and in the same weight range. And Patty was wearing red pants and a white top the night that she vanished. Suzanne and her late sister, Natalie, spent years gathering information regarding their mother's disappearance case. Suzanne has an entire binder filled with records, files, and interview notes. When it comes to if Patty was pregnant, there is no solid information to back that up, but we do know that it was said that she had been sexually involved with another man while she and Ralph were separated in the spring before she went missing. It is no secret that Ralph was extremely abusive to his wife. And even though they weren't together at the time, but they were still legally married, her being with this other man for this short period of time, this was enough for him to take all of his anger out on her. Who knows what he would have done if he found out that she was pregnant by another man. It is said that she was planning on finally leaving Ralph for good around the time that she went missing. Now, there had actually been another Jane Doe found in the woods on July 28th of 1978, this time in Portland, Oregon. An all points bulletin was issued by the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office on August 10th regarding this Jane Doe. On August 28th of 1978, the detective working Patty's case, Detective Tom Celine, prepared to send over Patty's dental records to compare to this Jane Doe's. The next day, the news broke of the discovery of another Jane Doe's remains, this one in the woods in Finley Creek Cow Camp. On August 30th, Lewiston police sent over the x-rays of Patty's to Portland to either rule her out as being either Jane Doe or verify her as being one of the two. Now, on September 8th of 1978, the detective working Patty Otto's case had actually received a message that a Dr. Brady out of Portland, Oregon had called. And the message read, the x-rays do not match those of the body found out of Legrand. The thing is though, 
that an all points bulletin had not been issued for Finley Creek Jane Doe until September 13th. So Suzanne thinks there was a slight mistake made and her mother was ruled out as being the first Jane Doe, not Finley Creek. The second one. Suzanne also could never find any records stating that any of her mother's x-rays or dental charts were sent over to Union County authorities, which are the ones in charge of Finley Creek Jane Doe's case. The Jane Doe found in the woods in Portland a month before Finley Creek would eventually be identified, but not as Patty. Suzanne though thinks that her mother may be the other Jane Doe found around that time in Oregon. Suzanne works as a registered nurse and she coincidentally lives in Walla Walla, Washington and has since 1999. Also, her father-in-law was actually a little boy in 1978 and was with the two hunters on their trip when they came across Finley Creek Jane Doe. One of those men was his father. Talk about a small world. She just has this strong connection to the case and feels there may be a huge possibility that Jane Doe is her missing mother. Suzanne would tell KLEW News that basically if this was a perfect case, they would be able to take her DNA and compare it to the Jane Doe's DNA. But considering that they don't even know where the remains are of the Jane Doe or her baby, and they destroyed all evidence having to do with the case, they are unable to do that. Suzanne told The Observer, I've been searching for my mom for years and I may have been next to her all of this time. She may have been sitting right here waiting for me to pick her up. Other than the remains that were sent to the crematorium and never picked up and have since been lost, we have to remember that her entire skeleton was never found. So there is a high possibility that some of her skeletal remains are still back around Finley Creek. Cadaver dogs have been brought to that area more than once. During August of last year, cadaver dogs did alert to a scent picked up at the spot where she was found at, and also a few other spots as well within the three acres that they were said to search. Union County Search and Rescue obtained over 50 bones, but in the end, None of them were from a human. Now, through the years, mostly due to the comparison of dental records, quite a few missing women have been ruled out as being Finley Creek Jane Doe. Those include Melanie D. Flynn, who went missing from Lexington, Kentucky on January 25th of 1977, Laura Flink, who went missing from Aberdeen, Washington on February 21st of 1969, Rita Jolly, who went missing from West Lynn, Oregon on June 29th, 1973, Lori Partridge, who I've done a video on, who went missing from Spokane, Washington on December 4th of 1974, Teresa Fitton, who went missing from Fort Lauderdale, Florida on August 1st of 1975, Sherry Jean Pickle, who went missing from Long Beach, California on May 16th of 1972. Robin Ann Petanato, who went missing from Whitefish, Montana on July 5th of 1975. Other rollouts without a photo or date of last being seen are Suzanne Hagedorn of Brighton, Colorado and Desiree Haas from Placerville, California. Patricia Otto has been ruled out, but a lot of people close to her case, like I stated before, believe that it may have been a mistake. A comparison between Patty and Finley Creek Jane Doe's dental would be done in 2021, but the results still left matters open. The conclusion of the report stated, our odontologist cannot make any type of determination based on the discrepancy of the records and the apparent inconsistencies with handwritten notes, x-rays, and charting of both the MP and UP. MP meaning missing person and UP meaning unidentified person. There is no definitive information or specific data to determine these remains are Patricia Otto. Both the MP and UP dental records are poor and quite possibly inaccurate. We could never be able to draw a conclusion based on the information we have at this time. Please let me know if you have additional questions. This review was based only on the physical data we have at our disposal. If more information or documents come to light, we of course would review them as well. Take care and be well, Dr. Nikki. I also have to mention that at the crematorium in Walla Walla, Washington, where Finley Creek Jane Doe and her baby's remains were sent to be cremated, there is a miscellaneous box. This miscellaneous box contains the remains of a variety of different people whose loved ones or the local police department never cared to pick up. The Finley Creek Jane Doe Task Force and Suzanne have worked alongside different medical examiners to try to extract some DNA from these cremated remains, but they have not been successful as of yet. It is very hard to extract DNA from cremated remains, but if there are larger bone fragments in 
those ashes, there is a slight possibility they could do that. When it comes to where this case sits now, it sits with mostly hope. Obviously an excessive amount of effort, but hope. Hope that they can somehow locate this Jane Doe or her baby's remains, whether that be the cremains or any other bones of the location that they were found at. Also, hope that possibly someone comes forward with any information, new information, to help eventually solve this case. If you have any information regarding the case of Finley Creek Jane Doe, you are urged to contact the Finley Creek Jane Doe tip line at 541-805-6873, or you can anonymously write in a tip at crimestoppersoforegon.com. There is a reward posted for any individual that comes forward with information that leads to an arrest. If you want to keep up with this case yourself, you can follow the Facebook page at facebook.com slash Finley Creek Jane Doe. Also, if you would like to donate to this case, you can send any donations to the Cash App, Venmo, or PayPal here on the screen. All of this information will also be in the description of this video. Mel said to me that she always likes to encourage people to get involved whether it's one click to share a post or searching their town up on the Doe Network like she did or reaching out to their local law enforcement agencies or advocacy groups to see if there is anything that they can do to help. Just do it. You never know what could come of it. There are so many cases out there that can use the extra help and she is a hundred percent right. Sometimes it just takes the right person with a different viewpoint or set of skills to help a case that really needs it. This woman was someone with people who loved her and have probably been wondering for all of these years what happened to her. We do have to take into consideration though that she could have possibly still been in her teen years. It doesn't seem like anyone in Oregon so far knows who she is or remember seeing her. So could she have possibly been a young runaway? It was the 1970s and we know that hitchhiking was more popular in those days. I came across an article from the News Tribune from 1975 regarding teens and running away and it states, runaways often come home when they get cold, tired, or too hungry. Some fail to come home from school and they show up by 10 p.m. the same night. They go on the records as runaways too. Some girls leave home because they are pregnant and are afraid to tell their parents. Others leave with a boyfriend who really cares for them. Some runaways simply stay out too late and are afraid to go home to face punishment. The vast majority have a problem at home they can't solve by staying on the premises. In certain instances, a child will run away for fear of causing trouble in the family. They run because they love their parents and don't want to hurt them. Nobody has an answer to the runaway problem. The reasons are too complex, too private, and too hard to solve. Of course, we don't know for certain if she was a runaway, but for now, in this case, all we really have are theories. Right now, her actual story before her death is unknown, but possibly someone out there knows something. So that is all of the information that I have for you today regarding the case of Finley Creek Jane Doe. And I wanted to thank Mel again for helping me with this video and answering all of the questions that I had. If there are ever any updates, and hopefully there will be regarding this case, I will 100% do a part two here on my channel. But until then, if there are any cases that you possibly want me to cover here on my channel, make sure to send those over to gabulosiscaserequests at gmail.com. And do remember that September is coming up and for September, I am just covering solved cases for the series here on my channel that I do every year, Solve September. With all of that being said, I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day. Stay safe and I will see you in the next one.